Uh, I'm really happy to be here, uh, everybody. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, I want to make sure, uh, can everybody see these slides clearly, uh, legibly, all that good stuff? Uh, if you cannot, uh, just throw it in the chat and uh, we'll fix it up. So um, I'm going to just be taking questions and uh, in the chat and in the QA. I don't think I have, I don't know how to see the raise your hand part. Uh, so if you could just put questions in the chat or QA, either one works. Um, I'm happy to just take questions as they come during the talk. There's going to not be a lot of slides. It's going to be mostly live coding. Um, so we're going to go full screen. Yeah, Kirk, we're going to go full screen for um, just the first few slides. And then we're going to switch over to, to VS Code and coding. So um, we'll be uh, doing most of the interaction that way. So um, this talk uh, can be summed up as Python loves Go. Um, that's how I like to sum it up at least. And um, the reason I put that heart there um, is because I really want to stress that we're not talking about Python versus Go. Uh, we're not trying to say Go needs to replace Python. Uh, we're not having a competition between the two. Um, we really truly are saying uh, that Go can be used to really improve your Python code base. Uh, so just a little bit more about me. Um, I am Aaron. Uh, I've been a Go programmer and teacher uh, for a little over seven years. Uh, and uh, the programming language has been around for almost 11 years now. So I've been doing it for quite a while now. Uh, I am a cloud advocate, a cloud developer advocate at Microsoft. I work uh, in the Azure group. Uh, there's a little sub uh, team inside of Azure called open source engineering. So my goal uh, in all the communities I work in is to improve the state of open source, which is uh, partially the reason why I'm here talking with you today. So I want to just jump right in. So it's really important, I think, and pertinent for us to start with the history of Go to figure out sort of where is Go coming from and how can we tap into some of that power. So first and foremost, Go was born at Google. Uh, there were some uh, actually very accomplished and smart folks at Google uh, who noticed that Google had this problem of uh, having a huge code base trying to build really big backend systems. Those are things like API servers, backend data processing jobs, and more. And a lot of their code base was Java, some of it was C++, and it was hard to maintain, hard to scale, hard to compile. And in fact, the story goes that uh, they first thought of this concept of a new language while they were waiting for a C++ code base to take 45 minutes to compile. So that's kind of a fun story. But uh, the overall idea is that uh, they want Go to be first and foremost uh, designed as a language that can scale. And that means scale up to lots of CPU cores and taking lots of requests incoming per second but also just as importantly, to be able to scale up to a massive code base that is collaborated on by a ton of people with different skill levels and different backgrounds uh, effectively and efficiently. And the most important feature of Go that really ties in to that scale concept is having simplicity and power sit hand in hand. And so there's, a, there's sort of um, a saying inside of the Go community that goes like this, simplicity is hard. Um, what that really means is that in order to take all of the power that Go unleashes and make it accessible via simple APIs that have simple concepts behind them is really, really hard. And uh, being a fan of Go, of course, I think that the Go language has done a very good job of unleashing the power of the underlying hardware that it runs on. So things like the networking and the file system and the CPU cores, uh, and unleashing that in a way that any programmer can take advantage of and not just the programmers that have deep underlying systems expertise. So I wanna jump in now to, with the background of Go and some of the basic features of Go in mind, how do Go and Python compare? So again, I'm not saying is Go better or is Python better. I'm really saying, how can we view the world of Go next to the world of Python so we can use Go to complement Python in different ways? 
So this little chipmunk that you see here, uh, that's the closest emoji I can get to a gopher. And gopher is sort of the, um, the mascot of Go. And actually, if you look right behind me, there is the plushy mascot of Go right where my finger is, the pink one. Um, so Go is really well suited for backend servers and backend data processing or other long running jobs. So you won't see Go as used as much for doing things like full stack development. Another really important feature of Go, built from the ground up to support multi-core systems. So you can have a Go binary, you can build your Go code and you can run it. And if you've written it in such a way, it can take advantage of every single core on your machine. Whether or not you have two cores or you have 64 cores, the program can scale up as necessary to take advantage of all of those cores without changing the code, without changing a constant for the number of threads or anything like that. Now on the other side of the coin, we've got Python. Now I'm assuming that you may know a little bit more about Python in this talk than Go. And if you don't, that's okay. Um, but I'm assuming that you probably already know that Python is a great tool for fast prototyping. You probably know that it doesn't have a lot of the syntax that other languages have as things like semicolons and squiggly braces and so on. Uh, and that's one of the big features that enables you to write Python programs really quickly. The other thing is you may be familiar with Python as a full stack web development tool. There's frameworks like Flask, which we'll see today, uh, and frameworks like Django, uh, both of which enable you uh, sort of out of the box to be able to build a full web app everything from the front end JavaScript, CSS stuff, all the way back to the database layer, talking to PostgreSQL and so on and so forth. So with that pro and con list in mind, there are two ways that we can sort of start integrating Go into our Python code base. One is to take patterns out of Go and apply some of those design patterns over to Python. The other way, which you'll see after this slide is actually to take some Python code out and replace it with Go code. So from the patterns perspective, one thing that Go really excels at, I mentioned simplicity. Part of simplicity means that there's not a lot of magic in Go. So you don't have things like function decorators. Uh, you don't have thing like, things like magic test mocks and things like that. Go also has less machinery. So there are not things like classes and object-oriented programming in Go. Now, in some cases in Python, it can be useful to, let's say you're writing a function, to take some of that concept of cutting down on the magic, cutting down on the machinery, and bring some of that concept to simplify maybe a function or a module in, my, in uh, Python. And that may be because a lot of people may be contributing to that code base over time, or maybe there are people who have less experience with Python and it would be good in that case to probably give them a cleaner and simpler code base that they can understand just by reading the code rather than having to read Python docs about the magic of machinery. Now, don't get me wrong. I love the magic in Python and I love the machinery that it gives you because it makes your life much easier in many cases. And that's where the fast prototyping versus the simplicity of Go balance comes into play. And depending on your use case, you'll have to find that balance yourself. And I'll give an example of the balance here when we do some code. Now, the second thing about Go is it is compiled. It is a compiled language. So your code runs through a program called a compiler. The compiler spits out a single binary. So this is a binary that you can run anywhere. So I am running Linux. On Linux, I can build a binary for Mac OS. I can email that binary to someone on Mac and they can run it just like they would run any other binary, like let's say command line utility like CD or LS. The third point here is for me and my style, the most important. And this is composition rather than extension. So in Python, you have classes and you extend those classes and implement other methods and so on. Go does not have extension. Go has something called composition. If you're familiar with Unix or Linux, you're probably familiar with the pipe concept where you have one program that outputs something, you can pipe that output to another program's input. 
With Go, you have a very similar concept. And if used properly, it can be very, very powerful. And we'll see a great example of that in the Go code we're going to write today. And then the last one, this one's a bit fuzzy, but it's important to keep in mind. Now, Go is a very highly concurrent language. So when you have concurrency, it's nice to cut down on the amount of global state that you're managing. And that's just because the more global state you have to deal with, the more chance that two different threads of execution will access it at the same time, which will create a race condition and undefined behavior. So in Go, it's really important to que clearly define where your state is going to be written or modified or mutated. Those are three words for approximately the same thing. Where is your state going to be changed? What is the code that is responsible for changing it? And draw a line around that code. And for all the code outside of that line, you, you make it so that code does not access the state. It only reads it, but it does not write or mutate it. Now, having that line can be really, really important for not only debugging, but also designing your code and designing that next feature and so on. So that's another thing that's really, really important and can be very useful for Python. OK, so we're going to get to the code now. You can see everything, including the slides and the code and all the readmes and everything else at this short link. So bit.ly slash ATO 2020. Uh, so I'm going to leave the slides now, uh, and I'm going to go into the code. Let me catch up on the chat real quick here. Uh, so we've got from Celine. I hope I said that. Oh, we've got from Richard. Sorry. Hope I said uh, that right, Celine. So Richard, uh, what is Go? Uh, so we're actually going to see the language in action here. It is a programming language. Uh, it is used for lower level systems level programming. So think about things like maybe an API server, or if you're writing a database, uh, or if you're accessing low level memory and things like that. Uh, so Celine says, much like how Google used to require Python experience for their Java developers, they wanted people to think in Python but write in Java. But in this case, think in Go and write in Python. Use the best ideas, regardless of which language it's expressing. Exactly. That is very well said. Thank you so much for that. I completely agree. The ideas are portable between languages. And we're going to see in this code, in this live coding, how we're going to take some of those ideas and move them around between languages. It's fun debugging a Rails app. Always asking, is this magic or is this a bug? Yeah, indeed. <laughs> uh, I think we've all been down that road. It may not be on Rails, maybe on another technology. Uh, but of course, one person's magic is another person's feature. If you are deep uh, embedded in the technology, you've been doing it for a long time, that magic is more like a feature that's given to you. Uh, whereas someone new to the language, uh, it may not be that. It may be completely mysterious. Uh, and with Go, the aim of the designers of Go was that almost nothing will be considered magic. And almost everyone who joins a, a project or a product or a team that's working on Go will be able to pick it up fairly quickly, enough to make meaningful conversations uh, without, excuse me, not conversations, enough to make uh, meaningful contributions without having to pick up a massive programming manual to learn all of the quote magic before uh, being able to jump in. Okay, so I've got VS Code here. Uh, this is not required to write Go at all. This is just my preferred uh, code editor. Um, you can use Vim, Vim has great Go support. Uh, you can use the Atom editor. Atom has great Go support. Uh, you can use Emacs, so on and so forth. The only IDE, the only editor that doesn't have Go support that I know of is Visual Studio. So this is Visual Studio Code. It's an open source uh, editor that's pluggable and you can get support for Python, Go, Ruby, JavaScript, you name it. You can even write C Sharp and other .NET technologies in here as well. So I love this editor, uh, but just as a preface, you do not need to use this uh, to write Go. So just looking at the folder structure, we already see sort of our first pattern that we can take to add some Go, to sprinkle some Go into our Python app. We've got a back-end folder and a front-end folder. Okay, so we've made 
We've made a split, sort of like I mentioned, we're drawing a line around our state. We've made a split between the front end code, the Python code that's gonna accept incoming requests from outside the system, from a, a command line or from Chrome or a browser, anything like that. And that is going to do a little bit of processing. And then it's going to forward some pertinent data to the back end. And that's the one written in Go. And that's going to manage the state. It's going to manage our database. It's going to manage some files and so forth. So starting with the front end, we've got our Flask app. Okay, So there's a lot of code here. You do not need to understand any of this. I will walk through the specific parts that we're going to talk about here. But the goal here is not to understand everything that the Python is doing. It's more to understand what we're going to, what functionality we're going to take out and replace with Go and how we're going to do that replacement. Okay, so what we are writing here is an application that you can give a URL to via a REST API. And it will go out, the Python code will go out, it will download that URL, it will expect it to be an image, of course. It will download that URL. It will save that URL into a file. So it will download an image and save it to a file. And then it will save some metadata about that image in a database. So for those who are familiar with Python, we're going to be using this uh, requests library to be doing that HTTP request to get the image. And we're going to also be using the pickle format to save uh, our database, the pickle right here. If you're not familiar with Python, uh, request is a convenient library to do HTTP requests out to a URL of your choice. And Pickle is a nice library built into Python that allows you to serialize and deserialize a Python dictionary or other Python data. I'm using it here to do a dictionary. So this is what a Python dictionary looks like. Uh, this is what it looks like to download the image. And this is what it looks like to open the Pickle database file. Uh, this is what it looks like to open the actual image file and actually create it and open it. So now down below, we can write the image that we just downloaded into the file. And now we're just doing some database operations. So uh, right here, uh, lines uh, 113 down to 116, we're writing some global state about our newly downloaded image. We're writing, we're updating the last time an image was uploaded ever, uh, keeping track of the total number of images and so forth. And now we are assigning the image a unique identifier, a UUID, and we're saving some metadata about the image. The name of the image, tags, uh, some identif identification tags, the URL that we downloaded from, and most importantly, the file name where the image was just saved. Okay. And then we're returning some JSON with this nice JSONify function. Uh, and we're saying, OK, the download was done and the image is ready. All right. So the one thing that I wanted to do in this Python code, but I was not able to do reasonably well, is compress the image. OK, so depending on the image that uh, the URL that you gave this application, the image could be fairly large. So in order to compress that, you have to use a Python library to do compression, of course. And the compression might take quite a long time. It might take a second or even two seconds. Now, Python is single threaded. So at least the default C Python implementation is single threaded. So what that means is for that one or two seconds that the image is being downloaded, no other routes will be able to respond. So effectively, the server will just be frozen in time until the compression is done. Now, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to have that, that uh, kind of poor performance on my server. So there is a way around that in native Python, and that is to use the multiprocessing module. And that will effectively fork a new Python process to handle that data processing. And then that can save the compressed file uh, to disk, and then I can figure out when that, that process is done. Uh, so that's a bit heavyweight uh, to launch a brand new process just to do one file and share a little bit of memory. Uh, but also, it would have been much more efficient for me, the programmer, for me, the programmer, not the machine, but for me, my efficiency and my understanding of the system, 
to just be able to share a little bit of memory to some other thread or some other core on my machine that's running. So I've got a multi-core system. Effectively, I'd be able to, I'd like to be able to take my code and say, okay, the compression part's gonna run over here on this core. And then when that's done, I want that to just write the compressed file down to my disk, but I can't quite do that here. Okay, so that's what we're gonna target. We're gonna target that functionality and we're gonna target to write that in Go because Go can do that on a background core, a background thread, and it can do that more quickly. Okay, so if I haven't broken everything, let's see this thing in action on the Python implementation before we go and take things out and run it on the Go side. So we've got a Flask app, so we're gonna run the Flask app. We're gonna go to localhost 5000, and we're gonna see there is no image uploaded. No images were ever uploaded to this server, okay. So I have a little canned curl request right here, and this is going to tell my server I want you to download and save this image. So this is an image of, a, of the Python logo. And I want you to call it Python. So then later I can go and take that image and show it on an HTML page. So I'm gonna copy this command. I am going over to this pane. I'll paste it in. And it took a little while. It maybe took, I don't know, 200 milliseconds, 250 milliseconds. Uh, but eventually it said done, and now the image is downloaded. So if I head over to here, now we've got one image. It was just downloaded, so I've got a last uploaded timestamp. And we can see a list, a list of the images. Now uh, we've got a Python image, and I'm going to try to load the Python image. And there we go. So this is all Python powered, and this page in particular is looking up where the Python image file is located, spitting out some HTML here. You can see it spits out an image tag and the image tag points back to the Python server and the Python server then serves up the image file itself. Okay, so it's a fairly complex system and we're going to move out a lot of the complexity into Go. So, we're going to head over now to our backend directory. Now you're going to see some Go code, which I uh, anticipate will probably be new for a lot of you, and that's okay. I'm going to point out some pertinent details of the Go code that are going to help us build this complex system. And then we're going to go and hook up the Python to that Go code. Okay. So this is what Go looks like. So remember, I said Go is compiled. So all of this code here in the main and all these other .go files, let me make this a little bit bigger for you. All these other .go files, image handler and process and so on, they will all be taken together, jammed into one file. The compiler will run over all of that and turn it into machine code. It'll turn it into Linux machine code or Mac machine code or Windows machine code. It even supports ARM and FreeBSD and, and other architectures as well. So uh, in order to do that, we use a Go CLI tool. It's literally just called Go. We just type Go run. This will compile it, and then it will immediately run the binary. Okay, so I've got an HTTP server that's running on port 5001. And this is the, this is a little kind of uh, this is the framework, a little framework I'm using for HTTP servers. Uh, similar to Sinatra and Ruby, uh, vaguely similar to Flask as well. So if we scroll down, this is all the database functionality and we don't really need to worry about this too much. Um, this is a highly, uh, a highly uh, optimized on-disk database for Go. Uh, so now we've got some dot get function calls and a dot post function call. So dot get and dot post register routes, just like in Flask. So this is saying, I want you to run this function right here when someone does a get request to the home page. Then similarly, I want when you do a get request to slash basic stats, uh, I want you to return the handling functionality that is returned. Sorry, I want you to run 
the functionality that is returned by this new basic stats handler function. Okay. So the one thing that I want you to keep in mind here is that we have types in Go. Okay. So in this case, for example, this function is taking in a parameter called C. So that's right here. But C has a type. The type is echo.context. And so if I have this function and I pass in anything else besides an echo.context, let's say I pass in a string or I pass in a different custom type, echo.otherContext or anything else like that, the compiler will break. It will not build my code into a binary. Now, this will remove a whole class of issues in your program. So in Python, there are issues where maybe potentially you meant to pass a string in, but you passed an int into a function. Or maybe you meant to JSON serialize a list, but you accidentally JSON serialize a dictionary. Okay, so there are things like that can happen in Python. So on the one hand, that can be bad. But on the other hand, the additional work and some boilerplate that you need to write to handle the static types can slow you down a little bit. So there's an efficiency versus a correctness trade-off here that we have to keep in mind. Now, the second thing here is if we go into our process image endpoint, um, this is where we handle an image upload. So going over to here, again, there's a lot of new stuff in here that we don't have to worry too much about. But I want to show off two things. So one here is we've got this thing called a struct. A struct is vaguely similar to a class in Python or a class in other object-oriented languages, if you're familiar there, uh, except that you can't extend it. So this is not an object-oriented concept. Uh, this is literally just a bucket of data. And you can define some behavior on that data. But when we need to do JSON deserialization and serialization, these struct fields have types. So this is a string, this is a list of strings here, and then another string. So we are telling the Go library for JSON, you need to make sure that when you deserialize JSON, that the URL parameter in the JSON is a string. And if it's not, that needs to be an error. And similarly for tags, it needs to be a list of strings and so on. Now, the second thing here, which I think is uh, very important, and the whole reason why we're applying Go to this particular problem is that we need to return to the Python immediately after we've started the download and compression and save process, okay? We don't wanna wait till that's done. Otherwise, we're not gonna be gaining anything from the Python because we're still gonna end up taking two seconds to do the compression. So. If you ignore line 37 in the go func, and then this line here, uh, I've collapsed all the code inside of this func. If you ignore this, and don't worry about what any of this is, if you ignore it, all we're doing is we are doing this c.bind, which is deserializing JSON into this struct right here. We're starting uh, and we're returning nil. Now, the only other thing here is the go, and then we have a func. What this means is that we are starting something called a Go routine. A Go routine is approximately similar to a thread in other languages like Java or C++, but it's a little bit more lightweight. But this will immediately start running in the background on a different core, or most likely on a different core. Now the Go runtime, and that runtime is compiled into my final binary. The Go runtime is going to take care of how do I run this thing in the background. We don't have to worry about scheduling the thread or anything like that. All we are saying here is I want you to run this function and I'll expand it in a second. I want you to run this function in the background, but I don't want you to wait till it's done. Instead, I want you to immediately go to return, return nil, which is effectively saying I'm done, return success back to the Python. Now we're gonna call this code from Python and we're gonna see how to do that in just a second. So if I expand this, there's a lot here. We're updating a database. Uh, we're creating a file right over here. What are we doing? We're downloading the image here. 
right here, we're doing the compression with gzip compression uh, and so on. There's a lot here and we don't need to understand all of it because all we really need to understand here is that we're starting the process, but we're not waiting till it's done. So let's go back to our Python and let's hook up some of this code to the Go. All right, so the first one we're gonna target is the one that we need to do compression, okay? So I'm actually gonna switch over to a different file because uh, we're running a little low on time. So I wanna switch over to a different file that has the new code in it, okay? So I have this app backend file. And if we head over to upload, we have similar code to the app. We're getting some JSON. We're doing some checks on the JSON. We don't technically have to do these, but uh, I like to make it a little cleaner. We're setting up something called a payload. And then we are sending that payload as a post request to our uh, backend host. So the backend host is going to be the Go server. So we're posting to backend host slash process image. Okay. So that is all we need for upload because we're sending just the data we need over to the Go. Now, again, this is an example of uh, cordoning off the mutable state to the go and only having our business logic here. So no databases anymore, uh, no mutating state anymore. We're only doing our business logic here, which is accepting in the request, the API request, transforming it a little bit, forwarding it out to go, and then getting back the result. Okay. So we've got our uh, backend host. Oh, sorry, I clicked on the wrong thing. So um, the uh, other pieces here, we've got uh, our route for image slash image name. And we saw that here up above. So image slash image name here had to go and look up the file name for the given image name. And then it had to render a template. So Flask is really good at this, render HTML template. I had to pass in the file name and the image name to the template. Okay, and the template was just responsible for rendering an image tag for that file name. Okay. Now on the app backend.py, if we head over to here, now things are different because the Go now has the database of image names and it also has the actual image data compressed. Okay. So we're rendering a template now called image backend, which is almost exactly the same as the template we just saw, except we get back the source of the image, not the file name. Now the source is going to be pointing back to the Go server because the Go server now is going to get the file name, read the file for that image, decompress the image, and send it back down directly to the browser. So the source points to the Go not the Python, okay? And we've got the home route and the home route just asks the Go for some basic statistics and that's pretty much it. All right, so let's try running this stuff together. So I'm gonna go run. I am gonna restart uh, the flask, uh, but instead pointing it to my app backend file instead of my app file. Last run. All righty. So now we've got Go. Go is managing the database. Uh, Go is managing all the image files. Go is managing all the compression. And we are going to send the same exact request to the Python. So again, we're sending it to localhost 5000. And that is the Flask, if you look right here on the left, bottom left. The Go is running on 5001. Send our request. And if you notice, it didn't take any, almost any time. It just immediately said status done. And the reason for that is again, Go is running the processing, the compression, the download, all that stuff in the background. And we saw some logs in the Go. It says starting processor. Uh, and right after it printed that out, it returned back to the Python and the Python returned back to the curl. So, Let's see it in action. So now we're gonna to go to the exact same 
uh, endpoint. So we've got num, num images is one. We didn't have the go return the timestamp. That was an oversight by me. Uh, we're still going to get the images list. Uh oh, did I not implement that? I guess it didn't implement that. We have the image endpoint though. And now this, if we look, uh, reload this and look on the network tab, this is going to 5001, not 5000. So that's going directly to the Go. So we saw a little bit of a snapshot on how to change some of our Python over to talking to Go. And I saw uh, in the chat here, I saw from Frank, I appreciate that long comment, Frank. So I saw uh, it's more a session on how to run Go in your Python. Uh, while Go is definitely more performant, not sure I consider this writing better Python. Why not leverage either async IO or futures libraries and stay in Python versus having to use two languages? I guess it depends on priorities and skill sets, not a judgment, just an observation. Unfortunately, I have to pop off for a meeting. Thanks for the session and so on. So yeah, Frank, I really appreciate that comment. And it actually comes down exactly what you said to skill sets and preferences. So there are of course some technical reasons why you may or may not want to use concurrent futures or async IO. And those are wonderful libraries for a lot of different use cases. In this use case, uh, I am more comfortable using Go for a few specific reasons. One is of course, I've been writing it for a long time. I've been writing Go for about as long as I've written Python. Of course, Python is a very much older language, but I have written Python for the same number of years approximately as Go. But also I identify uh, a very specific case, which is uh, a compute intensive process, that is the compression, that Go happens to be more suited for. So we are not saying in here that we should uh, attach Go and build a Python module in Go so you can call Go directly from Python or anything like that. We're saying that there are some very specific places that you can strategically take out some Python and put in some Go. And of course, I hope you can imagine that this image server can get significantly more complex. And for a lot of that behavior, like rendering more HTML and so forth, the Flask app would be very, very well-suited to do those types of workloads. So I am going to wrap up. I wanted, to mention, I wanted to mention one more piece here. So we did a lot of technical overview of the two different technologies. There are some what I call immeasurable features as well. So those are things like developer experience and programmer efficiency. Now, the Go code, I unfortunately can't show it. I don't quite have enough time. But the Go code, in order to download compress and save the file. And then on the other side, in order to read the file, decompress it and send it back to the Python, each one of those was one line of code in Go. There were two lines of setup and then one line to do the actual work. In Python, by comparison, that took about 17 lines, not including comments. Okay, so for that low level task, systems level task, it happens to be that Go is much more efficient in terms of how much code I need to write and understand. On the other side of the coin, if I go back to my command line, in Flask, I didn't write any extra code to do any of these logs. And on top of that, Flask will automatically reload the Python server for me when I change the code. So those are, those are some little differences in Go the systems level stuff is a lot easier in, in some cases. I'm not going to say all cases. But in Go, since Go is designed for systems level stuff, uh, it's a little bit easier. It tends to be a little bit easier over there. You can see I'm kind of walking a bit of a tightrope there because um, I definitely do not want to say that Python is not good for systems level programming. But it just happens for at least this use case, it is a bit easier to do a lot of these things in Go. But on the Python side, this Python app with Flask is really well suited for me to make fast progress without doing all the setup. It turns on a debugger for me by default. It logs out all of my requests and responses, including the response code and the path and timestamps. And it does even more than that out of the box, which is really, really a great thing. So 
I just want to mention one last thing, and then I'm going to go through questions. Um, I we're in sort of a new world now, right? So there are not a lot of in-person tech conferences these days. Um, I want to say thanks to you for coming here in this new medium and watching this talk. I know this is new for all of us, including me. Uh, for me, I wanted to open up a little bit more digitally uh, to as many people as possible to see not only this talk, but how this talk was built. Uh, so I wrote this talk completely on a Twitch live coding stream. It's down here, twitch.tv slash AR uh, You actually have to type twitch.com or twitch.tv there before the slash. Uh, I also want to say that during the building of this talk on those streams, it was a very collaborative process. A lot of the people in the chat helped me out, and I want to just thank all of them. But more so, I want to stress, and this is not about Python or Go. I just want to stress that we're in a new world. This is a very digital world now. There are not a lot of in-person conferences, like I mentioned. And I think it's really important for us to try to maintain the ties between ourselves, even though we have to do it digitally. But I also think it's a great opportunity to peek behind the curtain for things like, how do you build a talk and so on. So you can go to Twitch uh, slash AR slash, uh, and you can check out all the recordings on how I built the talk if you'd like. So I'm on Twitter at AR Schles, same as my Twitch and GitHub handle. Uh, again, you can see these slides at bit.ly slash ATO2020. And I am always available to talk uh, by email, chat, anything else. So if you want to chat about any of these topics, uh, hit me up, Aaron at ecomaz.net. All right, so I want to go back to the chat and uh, just catch up here. Uh, I was thinking basically, couldn't I use Flask to run these background tasks on a worker, but they're still Python. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah, of course. Of course you could. Yeah. And they may not be so inefficient, actually, if you do it on Python. You're going to have to have a background queue and background Python workers, but you can get that same concurrency as what I did with Go. If you can make sure that each little background Python worker only took up a core, you could have a similarly efficient system in that case. Uh, does, Go, does allowing Go to handle the deserialization from Pickle remedy some of the Pickle security considerations? Absolutely. It, indeed, it does. So you'll notice in the app backend, of course, there's no more Pickle. But also, I mentioned the statelessness. The Python code now has no state. It's not saving or reading any state from any database. Instead, we've exposed the database in a very specific API in the Go. And we only access it using these requests.post or requests.get calls. Uh, Dask, oh, Dask, not Flask. Dask does a fantastic job of man managing that. Check it out if you haven't. I will, I, in I indeed will check that out. So I am out of time. I wanna say thank you to everyone who joined. Thank you so much to everyone in chat who, uh, asked questions and gave comments. I appreciate all of you. Um, and with that, uh, I am, of course, I'll put up my information again. I'm, of course, always available uh, to chat more about this stuff. Very, uh, I'm, I'm very passionate, as you may have been able to tell, about all of this topic, Python, Go, architectures, and, and so on. So thank you again so much. I hope everyone has a great rest of your day, uh, evening, morning, wherever you are in the world. Um, I hope you all stay safe and um, stay well. Thank you again so much. Take care, everybody.